तो जिक्र हो सजा टी वी मैं हाँ थोड़े तो नर्शदीप अज सा टीम पहुंची हुई है विक्टोरिया के कल भी तुम्हें तो असी ओवरव्यू दिता से कि विक्टोरिया के अब बजट दसिया जाना तो दसया गया सी का कि पार्लियामेंट बिल्डिंग के टीम होनी है जो बजट लॉकडाउन की गल आती है तो ब्रिटिश कोलंबिया के बजट लॉकडाउन हो जाता है पार्लीमेंट बिल्डिंग के सिर्फ तो सिर्फ मिनिस्टर होंगे ने प्रीमीयर हों फाइनैंस मिनिस्टर पहला कॉन्फ्रेंस सेंटर के आती है जोड़ा कि बिल्डिंग तो थोड़ी जी कदम दूर है सामने वाली बिल्डिंग कॉन्फ्रेंस रूम है कॉन्फ्रेंस रूम के जोड़े रिपोर्टरस होंगे ने नाल उन्हें कैमरा परसन होंगे ने नाल रिपोर्टरस के एडिटोरीयल लिखण वाले होंगे ने तो नाल स्टेक होल्डरस होंगे ने वे वे होर लोग जोड़े ने पोलीटल नॉलेज रखते हैं टैक्नीकल नॉलेज रखते हैं वो सारे सवालों के जवाब देने दे हाजिर होंगे ने अज सवेर तो ही साम इतें पहुंची हुई सी सी पूरे अठ बजे इतने पहुँच गए थे जिते साढ़े फोन रख लए गए थ तो उस तो बाद बजट साढ़े सामने पेश कर दिता गया उस तो बाद हूँ डेढ़ बजे जो मिनिस्टर दोबारा राइज हुई है तो उस तो बाद फिर तो सूँ फोन जोड़े आ वापस दे दते गए हैं ताकि असी तो हाँ तक इनफोरमेसन पहुँचा देिए जोड़ा कुछ नौ बजे तो लैके डेढ़ बजे तक होया उस बारे भी मैं तुम्हें तो दस देव कि सब तो पहला मिनिस्टर ने प्रजेंटेन दी प्रजेंटेन तो बाद मिनिस्टर तो साढ़े मीडिया आउटलैट्स के वलों जोड़े ने वो सवाल किए गए उस तो बाद स्टेक होल्डर्स के नाल गलबात की गई कि किस तरह का यह बजट है किस तरह के नाल ब्रिटिश कोलंबियनस के लिए लाहेवंद होगा सो सारी देख रेख तो बाद हूँ आम जनता तक ये बजट जो पहुँचा दिता गया तो देख सकते हैं कि मिनिस्टर बजट न दस रही है तो मैं थोड़ा तो ट्रांसलेट करके दस दाँ कि बजट के कुछ होने वाला है बजट दो हज़ार तेई के कई मुद्दे के उत्ते कार्रवाई करेगा जो सारे तो वह मायने रखते हैं हूँ अज विक्टोरिया के बजट जोड़ा कॉन्फ्रेंस रूम के साडे द्वारा जोड़ा आ समझाया गया सू दसया गया तो पिछे देख रहे हैं लाइव जोड़ा वो किया जा रहा पार्लीमेंट बिल्डिंग तो जी कि साढ़े तो कुछ कदम की दूरी के उ बजट दो हज़ार तेई के सब तो पहली तरजीह जी दी गई है वो सेहत तो मानसिक सेहत संभाल सुधार दसया गया वधेरे किफायती रिहायश जो तो असी हाउसिंग की गल करते हैं फिर वातावरण तो उस तो बाद रहन सहन के खर्चे क्योंकि इनफलेशन अजक बहुत बद गई है उन्होंने कहा कि महंगाई दे सब कुछ प्रभावित हो रहा है इस करके सारिया चीज़ा जड़िया ने तरजीही तौर के उ इस बजट के रखिया गई ने बी सी एक रहन दे वीया थ असल चुनौतियों का सामना भी इतें ही करना पै रहा कल विश्व की महंगाई करके नहीं महामारी के कारण मौजूदा जड़िया स्थितियां ने चुनौतियां ने उन्ह कारण भी जोड़े साढ़े वित्त मंत्री ने कैटरीन कॉनरॉय उन्होंने कहा तो पता होना कि ब्रिटिश कोलंबिया के एक इस तरह की रवायत है कि जी न वित्त मंत्री है वह नवे बूट खरीदती है नवे शू खरीदती है क्यों क्योंकि नवी साल शुरू होया हों नवे खर्चे शुरू हुए होंगे तो इस वे ये रीत जी थोड़ी जी हट के की गई है मिनिस्टर ने कहा कि मैं इस टाइम शूज़ की लड़ नहीं मैं नहीं खरीद रही असी बजट रह के काम कर रहे हैं उन्होंने कहा कि इस साल का बजट उन्होंने लोगों सुरक्षित रखने मदद करता जो अजक दिया हाई इनफलेशन रेट्स में बर्दाश्त नहीं कर पा रहे तो नाल उन्होंने मुद्दा पर कार्रवाई करता जिन्हों की लोग परवाह करते हैं जिमें कि हाउसिंग किफायती हाउसिंग जी है वो सब तो पहला मुद्दा तो फिर उस तो बाद हैल्थ केयर जोड़ा वो दूजा मुद्दा दसया गया तिना साल दौरान लगभग से छे पॉइंट चार बिलियन डॉलर पब्लिक हैल्थ के इनवैसट कर दसे गए हैं तो फिर उस तो बाद जड़े ने लोगों होर लोड़ी दिया सेवावान देने दे दसे गए हैं कैंसर की संभाल के लिए भी फंड दिए गए हैं नवी सिखलाई सीटा हैल्थ केयर वर्कर फैमिली डॉक्टर के लिए बेहतर सहायता के न बी सी हैल्थ केयर कार्ज बलों का निर्माण करना शामिल दसया गया तो नशे की लत्त जिमें असी इलिस ड्रग्स की गल करते हैं उन्हें विस्तार के लिए वोद सर्विस विस्तार के लिए एक बिलियन डॉलर के नवे फंड जोड़े वह दसे गए हैं हूँ उन्होंने कहा कि इस तीन साल के दौरान ओपरेटिंग तो कैपीटल फंडिंग के चार पॉइंट दो बिलियन डॉलर जोड़ा दिता गया ता कि वधेरे हाउसिंग जी लोगों प्रदान की जाए इस समय बी सी की हिस्टरी के सब तो वह हाउसिंग के निवेश किया गया जोड़ा ये तीन साल मिनिस्टर के द्वारा दसाया गया तो उस तो बाद वित्तीय योजना के फंड सहायता के चार सौ बाहठ मिलियन डॉलर जोड़े ने वो सूबे पुलिसिंग दते गए हैं ताकि इनफोर्समेंट किया जाए इंटरविन किया जाए तो न्याय तक पहुँच की जाए इस करके उन्होंने भी पुलिस वाल भी सेवावान जड़िया ने दिखाई गई ने उन्होंने कहा कि विश्व भर के महंगाई वी है कल बी सी नहीं उन्होंने ये कि 
ਲਾਗਤਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਘੱਟ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ 2023 ਦੀਆਂ ਲਾਗਤਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਘੱਟ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਇਹ ਵਾਧੂ ਸਹਾਇਤਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਗਈ ਹੈ ਜਿਹਦੀ ਸਭ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ ਜ਼ਰੂਰਤ ਸੀਗੀ 2022 ਦੀਆਂ ਗਰਮੀਆਂ ਤੋਂ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਰਹਿਣ ਸੰਦੇ ਖਰਚਿਆਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਸਹਾਇਤਾ ਵਾਸਤੇ 2.4 ਬਿਲੀਅਨ ਡਾਲਰ ਦੇ ਸਹਿਯੋਗ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਹੁਣ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸੂਬਾ ਅਗਲੇ 3 ਸਾਲਾਂ ਦੇ ਦੌਰਾਨ ਨਵੇਂ ਖਰਚ ਉਪਾਵਾਂ ਅਤੇ ਟੈਕਸ ਕ੍ਰੈਡਿਟ ਵਿੱਚ 4.5 ਬਿਲੀਅਨ ਦਾ ਹੋਰ ਨਿਵੇਸ਼ ਕਰੇਗਾ ਤਾਂ ਜੋ ਵੱਧਦੇ ਖਰਚਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰਭਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੀ ਮਦਦ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾਵੇ ਅਤੇ ਸਹਾਇਤਾ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਜਾਵੇ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਨਿਵੇਸ਼ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਇਹ ਨਿਊਜ਼ ਰਿਲੀਜ਼ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਦੱਸੀ ਗਈ ਹੈ ਤੇ 3 ਸਾਲਾਂ ਦੇ ਦੌਰਾਨ ਲਗਭਗ 1.3 ਬਿਲੀਅਨ ਦਾ ਨਿਵੇਸ਼ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਲਈ ਘੱਟ ਲਾਗਤਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਹਿਯੋਗ ਦੇਣ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਫਿਰ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਗਰਭ ਨਿਰੋਧ ਦਾ ਮੁਫਤ ਪ੍ਰਿਸਕ੍ਰਿਪਸ਼ਨ ਮਿਲੂਗਾ ਫਿਰ ਮੌਜੂਦਾ ਕੇ ਤੋਂ 12 ਸਕੂਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨੇ ਕਿੰਡਨ ਗਾਰਡਨ ਤੋਂ ਲੈ ਕੇ 12ਵੀਂ ਤੱਕ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਭੋਜਨ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਫੂਡ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਵਿਸਥਾਰ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਫੰਡਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਪੋਸਟ ਸੈਕੰਡਰੀ ਵਿਦਿਆਰਥੀ ਇਨਕਮ ਡਿਸੇਬਿਲਟੀ ਅਸਿਸਟੈਂਸ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਫੋਸਟਰ ਪਰਿਵਾਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਹੋਰ ਸਿਹਤ ਸੰਭਾਲ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਫੰਡਿੰਗ ਕੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਹੈ 2024 ਤੋਂ ਸ਼ੁਰੂਆਤ ਕਰਕੇ ਬੀਸੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਔਸਤ ਤੇ ਘੱਟ ਆਮਦਨ ਵਾਲੇ ਕਿਰਾਏਦਾਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਇਨਕਮ ਟੈਸਟਡ ਕ੍ਰੈਡਿਟ ਦੇ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਪ੍ਰਤੀ ਸਾਲ 400 ਡਾਲਰ ਤੱਕ ਦੇ ਯੋਗ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਦੱਸੇ ਗਏ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਕ੍ਰੈਡਿਟ 80% ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ ਕਿਰਾਏ ਤੇ ਰਹਿ ਰਹੇ ਪਰਿਵਾਰਾਂ ਦੀ ਮਦਦ ਕਰੇਗਾ ਲਗਭਗ 75% ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਵਾਲੇ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਮੌਜੂਦਾ ਸਮੇਂ ਵਿੱਚ BC ਫੈਮਿਲੀ ਬੈਨੀਫਿਟ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਯੋਗ ਹਨ ਜੁਲਾਈ 2023 ਤੋਂ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕਰਕੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਪਰਿਵਾਰਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੇ ਮਾਨਸਿਕ ਭੁਗਤਾਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ 10% ਦਾ ਵਾਧਾ ਦੇਖਣ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲੇਗਾ ਸਿੰਗਲ ਪੇਰੈਂਟ ਨੂੰ ਪ੍ਰਤੀ ਸਾਲ 500 ਡਾਲਰ ਦਾ ਹੋਰ ਲਾਭ ਮਿਲੇਗਾ ਜੋ ਕਿ 10% ਦੇ ਵਾਧੇ ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਵਾ ਜੁਲਾਈ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਵੇਗਾ ਘੱਟ ਤੇ ਔਸਤ ਆਮਦਨੀ ਵਾਲੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਕਾਰਬਨ ਟੈਕਸ ਦੀ ਭਰਪਾਈ ਕਰਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਮਦਦ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਕਲਾਈਮੇਟ ਐਕਸ਼ਨ ਟੈਕਸ ਕ੍ਰੈਡਿਟ ਦਾ ਵਿਸਤਾਰ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਵੇਗਾ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਬੀਸੀ ਦੇ ਘੱਟ ਕਾਰਬਨ ਵਾਲੇ ਭਵਿੱਖ ਵੱਲ ਤਬਦੀਲੀ ਦੇ ਭਾਗ ਵਜੋਂ ਫੈਡਰਲ ਲੋੜਾਂ ਦੀ ਪੂਰਤੀ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਅਪ੍ਰੈਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵਧ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾਤਰ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ 2030 ਤੱਕ ਕਾਰਬਨ ਟੈਕਸ ਦੀਆਂ ਵਧੀਆਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਲਾਗਤਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਭੁਗਤਾਨ ਕਰਨ ਨਾਲੋਂ ਕ੍ਰੈਡਿਟ ਵਿੱਚ ਵਾਧੇ ਰਾਹੀਂ ਵਧੇਰੇ ਰਾਸ਼ੀ ਮਿਲਣ ਦਾ ਅਨੁਮਾਨ ਹੈ ਘੱਟ ਆਮਦਨੀ ਵਾਲੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਲਈ ਭੁਗਤਾਨ ਵਧੇਰੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਇਸ ਵਾਧੇ ਤੋਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਇੱਕ ਚਾਰ ਵਿਅਕਤੀਆਂ ਵਾਲੇ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਨੂੰ ਪ੍ਰਤੀ ਸਾਲ ਵੱਧ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ 500 ਡਾਲਰ ਮਿਲ ਸਕਦੇ ਨੇ ਜੁਲਾਈ 2023 ਤੋਂ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕਰਕੇ ਇੱਕੋ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਨੂੰ ਵੱਧ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ 900 ਡਾਲਰ ਮਿਲਣਗੇ ਬਜਟ 2023 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੁਦਰਤੀ ਸਰੋਤਾਂ ਦਾ ਪ੍ਰਬੰਧਨ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਧਿਆਨ ਕੇਂਦਰਿਤ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਪੁਰਾਣੇ ਦਰਖਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਜੰਗਲ ਵੀ ਸ਼ਾਮਿਲ ਕੀਤੇ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਆਰਥਿਕ ਖੁਸ਼ਹਾਲੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਜਿਹੇ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਨਾਲ ਮਦਦ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਤਾਂ ਜੋ ਵਾਤਾਵਰਨ ਸਮਾਜਿਕ ਤੇ ਸੱਭਿਆਚਾਰਕ ਟੀਚਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲਿਆ ਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਫਿਰ ਇਸ ਸਾਲ ਦਾ ਬਜਟ ਪੋਸਟ ਸੈਕੰਡਰੀ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਤੇ ਹੁਨਰਾਂ ਦੀ ਸਿਖਲਾਈ ਨੂੰ ਵਧੇਰੇ ਕਿਫਾਇਤੀ ਤੇ ਪਹੁੰਚਯੋਗ ਬਣਾਉਣ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਫਿਊਚਰ ਰੈਡੀ ਪਲਾਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਹਿਯੋਗ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਕਾਮਿਆਂ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਦੀ ਉਸ ਸਭ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਡੀ ਚੁਣੌਤੀ ਦਾ ਜਵਾਬ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਜਿਸ ਬਾਰੇ ਕਾਰੋਬਾਰਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਹੁਣ ਇਹ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਬਜਟ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਇਨਕਲੂਡ ਕੀਤੀਆਂ ਗਈਆਂ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਕਿਹਾ ਫਾਈਨੈਂਸ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨੇ ਉ
ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਬਜਟ 2023 ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਵਾ ਸੂਬਾ ਇਸ ਸਾਲ ਦੀ ਬਜਟ ਦੀ ਵਰਤੋਂ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਇਸ ਸਮੇਂ ਲੰਮੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਲਈ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਨ ਲਈ ਕੰਮ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ 2022 ਤੋਂ 23 ਵਿੱਚ 2.7 ਬਿਲੀਅਨ ਤੱਕ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਅਨੁਮਾਨ ਲਗਾਇਆ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਬੀਸੀ ਦੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਭਾਈਚਾਰਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੇ ਸੰਸਥਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਿਵੇਸ਼ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਨਿਵੇਸ਼ਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਗਰੋਇੰਗ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਫੰਡ ਰਾਹੀਂ 1 ਬਿਲੀਅਨ ਡਾਲਰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸ਼ਾਮਲ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਜੋ ਸਥਾਨਕ ਸਰਕਾਰਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਭਾਈਚਾਰਕ ਬੁਨਿਆਦੀ ਢਾਂਚੇ ਅਤੇ ਸੁਵਿਧਾਵਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਵਾਧਾ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਮਦਦ ਕਰੇਗਾ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਿਸ਼ ਕੋਲੰਬੀਆ ਦੀ ਨਵੀਂ ਜਾਰੀ ਕੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਕੈਂਸਰ ਸੰਭਾਲ ਰਾਜਨੀਤੀ ਦਾ ਸਮਰਥਨ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਬੀਸੀ ਕੈਂਸਰ ਫਾਊਂਡੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਵਾਸਤੇ 150 ਬਿਲੀਅਨ ਡਾਲਰ ਦੀ ਮਦਦ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਤੱਕ ਓਵਰਵਿਊ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਦੱਸ ਸਕਾਂ ਕਿ ਕੀ ਕੁਝ ਨਿਵੇਸ਼ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਫਾਈਨੈਂਸ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰ ਨੇ ਕੈਟਰਿਨ ਕਾਨਰੋਏ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਪੂਰਾ ਟਰਾਂਸਪੇਰੈਂਟ ਬਜਟ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਟੇਕ ਹੋਲਡਰਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਗੱਲ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਗੱਲ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਇਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਮਾਇਨੇ ਰੱਖਦੇ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਲੋਕ ਮੋਤਵਾਰ ਬੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੇ ਫੰਡਿੰਗ ਦੀ ਡਿਮਾਂਡ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੇ ਲੋਕ ਸੈਟੀਸਫਾਈ ਨਜ਼ਰ ਆਏ ਤੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੇ ਲੋਕ ਇਹ ਕਹਿ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਕਿ ਅਜੇ ਹੋਰ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਨਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਬਾਕੀ ਹੈ ਹੁਣ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਕੁ ਕੰਮ ਸਰਕਾਰ ਦੇ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਲਿਬਰਲ ਜਦੋਂ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਵਿਰੋਧੀ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਇਹ ਕਹਿੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਕੁਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਬੰਦਾ ਇੰਪਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਹੈ ਹੁਣ ਕਿੰਨੀ ਕੁ ਇੰਪਲੀਮੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਕੀ ਕੁਝ ਕਿਹਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਬਾਰੇ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲਾ ਸਮਾਂ ਦੱਸੇਗਾ ਪਰ ਫਿਲਹਾਲ ਓਵਰਵਿਊ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਨਾਲ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਛੱਡ ਕੇ ਜਾਣੀ ਆ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰ ਕੈਟਰਿਨ ਕਾਨਰੋਏ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਅਜੇ ਵੀ ਬਜਟ ਸਪੀਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਦੇਖੋ ਕੀ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਹੈ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰ ਦਾ ਹੋਰ ਕੀ ਕੁਝ ਕਿਹਾ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਪਰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਦੇਖ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਪੂਰਾ ਤਾੜੀਆਂ ਮਾਰ ਕੇ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਐਨਡੀਪੀ ਦੇ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਬਜਟ ਦਾ ਇਹ ਬਜਟ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਰੱਖਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਇਹ ਬਜਟ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਕੁ ਕਾਰਗਰ ਸਾਬਤ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਆਉਣ ਵਾਲਾ ਸਮਾਂ ਦੱਸੇਗਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਕਿ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਤੱਕ ਜੋ 9 ਵਜੇ ਤੋਂ ਸਵੇਰੇ 1 ਵਜੇ ਤੱਕ ਹੋਇਆ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਡੀ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਹੋਈ ਹੈ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰ ਨੇ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਜਲਦ ਹੀ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਤੱਕ ਪਹੁੰਚਾਇਆ ਜਾਵੇਗਾ ਕਿ ਕੀ ਕੁਝ ਕਿਹਾ ਗਿਆ ਫਾਈਨੈਂਸ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰ ਦੇ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਤੇ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਹਫ਼ਤਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰਸ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਵੀ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾਵੇਗੀ ਕੱਲ ਤੋਂ ਹੀ ਸਾਡੀ ਟੀਮ ਇੱਥੇ ਹੀ ਸੀਗੀ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਅੱਜ ਬਜਟ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਹੋਏ ਸੀ ਕੈਮਰਾਮੈਨ ਕਰਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਚਾਵਲਾ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਮੈਂ ਅਰਸ਼ਦੀਪ ਬੱਟੂ ਸਾਂਚਾ ਟੀਵੀ Good morning everyone and thank you for joining us at the annual budget lockup. I'm uh, I'm pleased to be presenting this uh, three-year plan in person today on the land of the Lekwungen speaking peoples the Sanhees and Esquimalt nation. And I'm honored to be on the territory and I'm honored to present you with the details of BC budget 2023. And I have to say how happy I am to see people here and downstairs. Even though I'm bringing a rural angle to the budget, I didn't expect to bring rural weather to budget day. So very happy everybody's here. We know that British Columbia is a great place to live. This is a beautiful, diverse province with strong, caring communities, but people are facing real challenges. And we know we are not alone. Global inflation is squeezing household budgets everywhere. It's harder to afford groceries or find essential medication for your kids. Then there's the added pressure of economists predicting a global slowdown. The province can't control global forces. but we can make choices that help protect british columbians and build a stronger more secure future we all want when times are tough you need government in your corner budget 2023 reflects the improvements we need to
The new spending also includes the Rental Protection Fund that was announced in January. The fund protects people from evictions and rent hikes while preserving rental buildings. And there is $2.7 billion in more spending to support British Columbians through supplementary estimates. The projected surplus will continue to change as final revenues and the resources are determined and as we continue putting resources to work for people. As always, we'll provide a full account of the province's financials for 22-23 this summer as part of public accounts. We know this year's surplus is unlikely to happen again, which is why we are tabling supplementary estimates along with this budget. This is an important step to secure more spending authority and get this surplus money to work for people now. Because we know that supporting British Columbians will build a stronger province for us all. Support like the $1 billion Growing Communities Fund, which will go directly to growing communities right across the province. It will support the improvement of local roads and, and water facilities and build more community centres, pools, trails and arenas. From infrastructure to connectivity to emergency preparedness, these investments will make a positive difference for people, businesses and communities. It's been a difficult few years. But BC's economy has been resilient in the face of pandemic, geopolitical, and climate-related challenges. Despite it all, we have seen strong economic performance in areas such as our labour market and home building. But there are also areas where activity is slowing. BC's labour market is strong, with the unemployment rate near historic lows at 4.4% in January 2023. But there are high job vacancies in some sectors like construction, accommodation and food services. The increase in workers has not kept pace with the demand in these areas and we've heard it firsthand from businesses. We're seeing people spend more on services like tourism and hospitality. Meanwhile, increased rates and prices are affecting consumer spending on goods, particularly big ticket items like vehicles. Nominal retail sales growth in BC has softened, rising by just 2.7% in 2022. On housing, construction activity continues to be strong, with the second highest number of housing starts on record last year at around 46,700 units. That's well above the 10-year historical average. At the same time, we've seen home sales fall significantly in response to increased interest rates. In 2022, MLS home sales decreased 35%, and activity was well below average in the second half of the year. The MLS average sale price has also softened, falling almost 18% from February 22 to January 23. As always, housing remains a priority for our government, and we continue to monitor these trends closely. High prices are affecting the cost of living for households. Inflation in BC reached 40-year high last May and declined to 6.2% in January. We are seeing the worst effects on how much we are paying for food, shelter and transportation. In response to rising inflation, central banks have raised interest rates faster than expected, affecting the cost of borrowing for people as well as the province. The latest update is that Bank of Canada singled its intent to hold rates steady for now. Regarding trail, trade, the value of goods exports was strong on an annual basis with growth of almost 20% in 2022. However, the value of goods exports started to decline in the latter half of the year in response to lower commodity prices. Exports are down 25% since May. Meanwhile, service exports continue to recover as tourism picks up as people continue to resume travel. The economic outlook for most of BC's major trading partners, for example, the rest of Canada, US, China, Japan, has weakened. That's due to a number of factors, including higher interest rates and uncertainty associated with the war in Ukraine. And while it may feel like the pandemic is over in some regions, it still remains a risk globally that could affect labour, trade and supply chains. So let's turn to the outlook for BC's economy. In Budget 2023, we are forecasting that BC's economic growth will slow to 0.4% in 2023. The slower near-term growth projection largely reflects the combined effects of elevated price pressures and tighter monetary policy working their way through the economy. This isn't unique to BC. We're expecting a similar slowing throughout Canada and the world. Looking beyond 23, economic activity in BC is expected to gradually recover. And you can see real GDP growth is forecast to rise in 2024. And then range between 2.2 and 2.4% annually over the medium term. The Ministry's forecast for BC is similar to the average outlook provided by the Economic Forecast, forecast Council with prudence in the near term. 
So Budget 2023 builds today for a stronger tomorrow. These uncertain times require careful, thoughtful action. And the choices this budget makes address not only the uncertainty ahead of us, but also moves in long-standing priorities. Budget 2023 reflects the priorities we've heard from British Columbians. And in the face of challenges of global inflation, Budget 2023 continues to help people here at home with costs. Through the key investments I'm about to highlight, I'll show how Budget 2023 will strengthen and health and mental health care so people can find and stay connected to the care they need. We'll take bold action to make homes more affordable and attainable for people in BC. We'll ease the stress on household budgets and put money back in people's pockets to help with everyday costs. We'll increase services and support the foster safe and healthy communities and set the groundwork for a strong, sustainable economic process through BC's greatest resource, people. We are all better off when a good life is in reach for everyone who calls BC home. And by helping people, families, businesses and communities today, Budget 2023 builds a stronger, more secure future for everyone. Before I begin with our investments, I'd like to speak to our long-term fiscal sustainability at the, as a province. This sustainability is essential. We're focused on finding a way back to balance, but not at the expense of British Columbians and the services we all rely on. This is why, once again, we present a plan with declining deficits, starting at $4.2 billion next year and declining to $3 billion by 25-26. We have focused on people since day one. And Budget 2023 expands on historic investments made since 2017 to help build a stronger, more secure BC for everyone. This includes more than $16 billion in new ministry operating funding and $10 billion more in capital funding. At the same time, we remain prudent and significant contingencies allocated to specific areas to prepare for any unknown costs. This includes $7.5 billion for the shared recovery mandate, $1 billion for ongoing pandemic response and recovery measures, and $750 million over the next two years to support recovery from climate emergencies like the November 2021 flooding. Our overall debt for 22-23 is lower than what was projected this time last year because of our surplus. It's important to note that our debt is expected to increase and that will finance the operating and capital investments we need now. Knowing that, our debt burden remains manageable. Other key metrics, the taxpayer debt to GDP ratio is expected to remain below 25% across the fiscal plan, lower than many other provinces. And taxpayer supported debt at the end of the three year fiscal plan is forecast to be 99 billion. People want to know that strong health care will be there when they need it. At the same time, coming out of the pandemic, health care workers have never been under such great stress. These challenges are not unique to BC, which is why provinces have been working with Ottawa to help us deliver better care. But we're not waiting. We need care we can count on now. Budget 2023 takes the next steps to strengthen BC's health care system with $6.4 billion in new investments over the fiscal plan. This funding is dedicated to support the growing demand for health services as our population increases and ages. This includes an initial investment in the cancer plan Minister Dix recently announced with more investments to come in future years as the plan rolls out. Our health care system is only as strong as the people who keep it running. That is why Budget 2023 delivers a new deal for family doctors and supports BC's health care workers. It will help us recruit, train and retain more family doctors, nurses and other high allied health professionals. Mental health is health and we're making the largest investment in mental health and addiction services in BC's history. Combined with our capital investments, we will bring the new mental health spending to more than a billion dollars, which includes the budget investing 867 million over three years. Our focus will be on expanding supports across the spectrum of care for people struggling with addiction. We'll do this by expanding the number of treatment and recovery beds, by creating new recovery communities to support those who have gone through treatment, and by delivering more Indigenous treatment centres and wraparound services to youth. This will all feed into our work to develop and implement a new model of seamless care, one that supports people through their entire recovery journey, from detox to treatment to aftercare.
This includes new investments for the Road to Recovery Initiative in partnership with Providence Health and the Vancouver Coastal Health. The same goes for the Redfish Healing Centre in Coquitlam, a first of its kind in North America. At the centre, complex mental illnesses and addictions are treated simultaneously. With this year's budget, we will be expanding the Redfish model of care so more people have access to these services closer to home. And we're continuing to put funding aside to support our continued health response to COVID-19. With new Budget 2023 investments, health and mental health annual funding has increased by nearly 10 billion since 2017. Total investments will grow to more than 30 billion a year by 25-26 and will support improved healthcare services for British Columbians. It's about taking action now to deliver better care for more people. We know that housing is top of mind for people throughout the province. An affordable, accessible home is part of what it means to build a good life in BC. For too long, the housing market worked well for investors, speculators and banks, not for everyday people. After five and a half years of work, we're starting to see results. 40,000 homes are built or underway, and we're seeing record construction on new rental housing. Budget 2023 includes a bold housing action plan with more than four billion in new operating and capital investments to build on the work done so far. Work like lifting strata restrictions, setting new housing targets for communities that need it, and creating a rental protection fund to preserve older rental units. The details of the plan will be released this spring. And it will take new steps to build and unlock more homes for middle class families, for indigenous peoples, and for renters and those with the greatest needs. We're also creating more student housing spaces throughout BC to help ease pressure on local markets and build on the thousands of student beds already open or underway. We're also increasing housing and services near public transit hubs around the province. This year's budget will fund more supportive housing and strengthen existing programs that help vulnerable people keep their homes. And we're adding hundreds more units of complex care housing. And we've done a lot of work already, and there is still a lot of work to do. Budget 2023 is investing in the delivery of homes for all kinds of British Columbians because too many people are struggling to find a decent home even if they have a good income. Not only are we investing in new housing, we're clearing the way for more housing with zoning changes and a faster permitting process. Since 2017, we have invested over four times the amount of annual operating spending on housing initiatives. And in Budget 2023, we have $1.9 billion budgeted for next year alone. On top of this, there is $800 million in capital spending planned for housing for next fiscal year. Our economy is attracting talent from around the world and we're looking ahead to another year of strong population growth. With the predicted one million job openings in the next decade, this is great news. The best we can make for our future is on the people of BC and that's what we're going to do. Budget 2023 invests 480 million in our future ready plan to grow the most inclusive and talent driven workforce in Canada. The details of the plan are coming this spring and it will take action to close the immediate and long-term skills and labour supply gaps. The plan helps to ensure that people do not face barriers in building the skills they need to succeed today and in the years to come. We've heard from businesses across sectors that their biggest challenge right now is finding skilled workers. And our plan is to help employers across access the talent they need, including funding to assist small and medium-sized businesses and help them find and implement technology and practical solutions to current labour market challenges and prepare for a changing global economy. Budget 2023 also supports a clean economy and climate resiliency. When we think about tomorrow's economy, sustainability and innovation are top of mind. We are guided by our Clean BC Roadmap to 2030, a continent-leading plan to reduce emissions while creating family-supporting jobs and strong communities. Budget 2023 builds on our Clean BC commitments with new targeted improvements and investments in active transportation networks across the province. We're also investing in more emergency management capacity for communities to better respond to fire, flood or heat emergencies. And we are providing more resources to speed up and modernize the permitting process to unlock more economic potential throughout the province. We know BC is a wealth of economic opportunity when done sustainably and responsibly. And it's where we see the results of a new approach to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. The future lies in a rights-based partnership approach to decisions respecting land, water and resource stewardship. And that's our focus.
That is why our budget invests $21 million to advance our work on old growth and forest stewardship with Indigenous communities who play a critical role in these temporary deferrals. BC's Climate Action Plan is a key part of Canada's plan, which in turn is part of a global solution to reduce emissions. Carbon pricing is an important part of our Clean BC roadmap. Budget 2023 outlines a path ahead through a Made in BC carbon output pricing system for industry. And in line with the federal government's requirement, a carbon tax that increases by $15 per tonne each year until the price reaches $170 per tonne in 2030. But ordinary British Columbians already struggling with costs can't bear this cost burden alone. Which is why as the price on pollution rises, so will the act climate action tax credit. Budget 2023 will deliver more money to more households through an enhanced climate action tax credit. Where a family of four would have received a total of $500 last, last year, the same family will receive almost $900 starting in July. A significant majority of people are projected to receive more through the credit than they pay in increased carbon tax costs by 2030. I know some people are feeling particularly vulnerable right now. Vulnerable about making sure they can pay their rent or their mortgage, about going to the grocery store, about day-to-day -day expenses that have gone up with inflation. Premier David Evey directed all of us in Cabinet to have these people and pressures front and centre in our minds as we work together across government to build Budget 2023. This budget provides new targeted supports for people's, people hardest hit by increased costs. As mentioned, the Climate Action Tax Credit has been increased and is one of the ways we're helping people with the costs of daily life. In addition, we're also increasing the income ceiling so that more households can get the supports that they need. Our goal is to have 80% of BC households receiving some portion of the tax credit by 2030. And starting next year, renters in BC will be able to claim the new renters tax credit. This income test tested renters tax credit will give low and moderate renters back as much as $400 per year. And we know that one third of all British Columbians rent their homes. And we expect it will benefit more than 80% of renters households. We, also permanently, we will also permanently increase the BC Family Benefit. Starting in July, families with children will see an additional 10% on their monthly BC Family Benefit. Single parents will be able to count on that 10% boost and as much as $500 to top up their annual benefit amount. When you look across 18 years, this increase alone could provide a two-parent family with two children with an extra $4,500. For a single parent with one child, this increase will provide almost $12,000. Parents will have more support and flexibility to buy food or clothing, pay the bills, or even enroll your kids in extracurricular activities. Altogether, these three actions will give more than $3 billion in supported targets for people with low and moderate income. Well, addressing the cost of living does, doesn't mean just giving money back to people. It also means removing barriers and providing better access to the resources that people need. And when it comes to essentials, having full control over your reproductive rights is at the top of the list. Prescription birth control is a necessary health care, not a luxury. It's a vital resource for equity and equality. And I'm happy to announce that as of April 1st, British Columbia will become the first jurisdiction in Canada to fully cover prescri prescription contraception. We know costs vary, but it really does add up. For someone who pays $25 a month, that's $300 in savings every year, and can be as much as $10,000 in savings over their lifetime. To address other costs of living, we are expanding existing school food programs for kids throughout BC. And we can make sure that no child has to learn on an empty stomach. We are also helping students access post-secondary education by doubling student loans maximums. This will increase from 110 to a total of 220 per week for individuals and from 140 to 280 per week for students with dependents. This is the first increase to student financial aid allowances since 2006. To help British Columbians relying on income and disability assistance to make ends meet, we are providing more support. For the first time since 2007, we are increasing the shelter rate for people who receive income and disability assistance, along with increases to emergency supplements and earnings exemptions. And for too long, the essential work of foster families and other caregivers has not received enough respect or compensation.
foster families will see their rates increase by 47 percent. This will help foster parents cover the rising costs of essentials like food, gas, and clothing. People need to feel safe in their home and their community. Budget 2023 backs our Safer Communities Action Plan with a commitment of $462 million. In the fall, we announce more support for policing, including specialized rural police and enforcement programs as part of this plan. These new response teams will monitor and address repeat violent offenders and help keep them off the streets. And this new funding in Budget 2023 will help improve access to justice by continuing to update the Police Act and adding more resources to the BC Human Rights Tribunal. As well, we are working to break the cycle of reoffending. It begins with addressing the poverty, trauma, and health issues that brought the person to the justice system in the first place. That's why we're making significant new investments across the spectrum of care. People in crisis will be met early on by healthcare workers and people who understand what they're going through. And it will free up officers to focus on stopping crime. Budget 2023 will also include 10 more Indigenous Justice Centres in partnership with the BC First Nations Justice Council, bringing the total network to 15. These centres provide culturally safe and welcoming places that provide legal help, early resolution programs, and support services for healing and wellness. Addressing the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in the justice system is a top priority, both for our government and for the BC First Nations Justice Council. Budget 2023 also provides significant new fund funding to support agreements under the 2022 Shared Recovery Mandate. This historic investment provides fair and reasonable increases to wages, including significant inflation protection to BC public sector workers. This will help to support and retain the people we all depend on, including those in healthcare and education, to improve the essential services that British Columbians rely on. Overall, the fiscal plan includes $15.1 billion for the estimated costs of the mandate. Capital spending over the three-year plan is increasing to $37.5 billion in Budget 2023. We're delivering the schools, hospitals, transit, highways and other infrastructure people rely on. With the largest infrastructure investment in BC's history, this is a place to be for good family-supporting jobs. This investment strengthens the economy, directly and indirectly creating approximately 125,000 jobs over the three years. And Budget 2023 looks at all capital investments through an environmental, social and governance lens. This means being a leader on innovative mass timber construction, creating more childcare spaces, incorporating energy efficient and low carbon design, creating a safer and more resilient network of infrastructure, and creating more apprenticeship and training opportunities in local communities, particularly for traditionally underrepresented people who want to build a career in the trades. Government continues to balance the near-term priorities with longer-term fiscal sustainability. And while there are risks of a global economic slowdown, we remain committed and on track with the fiscal guardrails that have helped guide budget decisions making since Budget 2021. These in, this includes the declining deficits, higher levels of prudence, and ensuring funding is targeted toward the most urgent of issues, while keeping an eye on our debt and debt affordability. We have seen how this approach has worked to build a strong economic recovery in BC, and we will continue to support the province in tackling today's biggest challenges while balancing responsible fiscal management. As mentioned earlier, provincial debt is expected to increase to support the operating and capital needs of the province. Our taxpayer-supported debt-to-GDP ratio, which is measured as a percentage of our GDP, remains relatively low. And we expect it to grow to 23% by 25-26, which is lower than many other provinces. In the second chart, the cost of servicing our debt remains very low. Only 2.4 cents per dollar of provincial revenue is going toward interest payments in 22-23. And if there's anything we have learned over the past few years, it's that going it alone won't work. We can only succeed if everyone is on the journey with us. We really are all in this together. The budget is our map, our compass, to guide us forward as one. And it makes a smart strategic investments to help BC through the challenges of today. Budget 2023 puts more money in people's pockets. And it addresses the barriers that continue to cause pressure in people's lives. Budget 2023 improves health and mental health services. And it supports safe and healthy communities. 
Budget 2023 sets the stage to help us improve the housing markets and build a stronger, cleaner economy for the future. From new supports for families to help them get through the day to day, to building new homes, hospitals and schools for our communities, to taking action to revitalize and refresh our healthcare system, and investing in skills and education to help fill the new jobs of tomorrow. Budget 2023 pays attention to today's very real challenges while planning for an even stronger future for our province. I want to thank you all for your participation today and look forward to your questions later on today. Thank you. Uh, Minister, we finally have the renter's rebate. Uh, it has come now in the form of a credit uh, rather than a direct rebate uh, check to people. Have you watered down uh, this promise that your government has made in back-to-back -back elections? Absolutely not. No, uh, renters across the province will be getting the renter's rebate. Uh, we feel that about 80% of people that rent will get a will get some form of the rebate. Um, people up to 60,000 that make up to $60,000 will actually get the full rebate, and from 60 to 80,000 will get uh, the partial rebate. But about 80% of people in the province will actually be getting the rebate. Follow up, Richard. Massive carbon tax increases coming over the next decade. Uh, those will have impacts on what we pay at the pumps. Uh, some estimates have it more than 30 cents a litre uh, by 2030. What do you expect drivers to do here in the province in terms of absorbing those costs? Or is the expectation that people largely will be out of vehicles that use gas uh, by that point? I'd say both. I mean, that's the goal with the uh, electrification BC is to have more people driving electric vehicles, but also with the um, the climate action tax credit um, by 2030, when we get up to that at the highest level of, of the um, carbon tax, which is mandated. You know, it's, it's from coming from the federal government. We're working together because when we all work together, we're dealing with the global uh, issues around climate change. Um, the amount that people get on their on the CATSI, the Climate Action Tax Credit, will actually be more than what they pay for at the at, in carbon tax. Our next question comes from Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Good day, Minister. Thanks for doing this. The uh, budget has a lot of talk about a new housing strategy. Uh, the budget documents show a 16.5% decline in housing starts this year and flat for the next four years after that. I'm wondering how you square that. Uh, with the promise of a more ambitious uh, housing plan when housing starts seem to be going in the opposite direction. Well, we're going to continue to work together with, with industry. We've got a number of initiatives that we've brought forward to help to ensure that we are uh, getting those, those housing complexes built. Um, we're looking at more housing for renting, uh, people renting, as, as well as looking at a number of issues. There's going to be more information coming forward. I mean, I don't want to... Uh, take the uh, announcement away from Minister Kalin, but he will be coming forward with the, the detailed housing plan in, in coming soon. The, uh, I want to ask about the carbon tax increase too, because according to your officials, uh, the carbon tax is going to go from 11 cents a litre to 37 cents a litre by the end of the decade. Can you square that with affordability for many people who drive their cars? Well, we can, yes, because there's, uh, we've got the affordability credit, we've got the BC family tax, you know, BC family credit, um, again, the, the um, climate action tax credit, there's a number of affordability issues that we've been bringing in, and, and we feel that uh, th those uh, credits will remain in place and we'll be able to help people with that. Our next question comes from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Hi, Minister. Uh, you've got record spending on capital projects in this budget, and I'm just wondering, where is the labour going to come from? Well, that's coming from our uh, skills and training plan that we're, we're bringing, the future ready plan that uh, Minister Robinson will be announcing soon. Um, and we are bringing in all kinds of supports to make sure that we are training people. Um, we're also looking at uh, things like uh, bringing in, um, like for increasing or fast tracking foreign credentials for people to come in and work in, in projects. So there's a lot of different initiatives that we're doing that she'll be talking about, or Minister Kalen will be talking about in the housing plan. Follow up, Binder? Yes, so in previous um, budgets from the NDP, we've seen a big focus on childcare. I'm not sure if I saw anything in, in, in these documents. Um, where is childcare at? Are you done? Are we expecting to get towards uh, more spots for $10 a day daycare? 
talking to an early child educator. No, we're not done. Um, we're in year five of a 10-year plan, and we are going to continue to invest, invest in childcare spaces across the province, as well as investing in early childhood educators. We know we need both. I think that when you see that we've included childcare with early with uh, the education as a ministry, that that's our focus is to ensure that we're putting more childcare into schools because that makes sense. And so, absolutely not. Childcare is still very much a priority for this government. Our next question comes from Katie DeRosa, Vancouver Sun. Hi, Minister. On the mental health and addiction of funding specifically for treatment, mm -hmm. will the funding in include uh, removing user fees for all treatment spaces right now? The, it will include the, uh, removing fees for the uh, new beds that are being created, and uh, we will continue to invest in, in mental health and addictions. Right now, the focus is on treatment and recovery, and, and I think that's where Follow up, it's a good Katie? thing to go. <laughs> On um, the psychological uh, association of or psychologist association of BC was calling mm -hmm. for uh, psych psychological services to be covered under MSP. Mm -hmm. That's not in the budget. Uh, why not? Because we're looking at a multifaceted uh, way of, of, of treatments, and that's what Minister Whiteside is looking at right now. And, and we, as we move forward, we'll make changes. But right now, it's about uh, recovery and, and treatment. Our next question comes from Rob Shaw, Czech News. Um, just on Katie's point, I, I don't understand why you've left the fees on. It's the single biggest investment, you said, in mental health and addictions. Mm -hmm. Why are you still charging people to get public treatment? Because our focus is on um, treatment and is on recovery and, and moving forward. And we know that there's, you know, there, there, it's going to be an ongoing process as we see what, what's going to work and what's not. We're also providing more supports through primary care, which is actually the first place people go to when they're looking. When you get to a position and when you're dealing with, with addictions or mental health issues, you go to that primary caregiver. So we're expanding the primary care supports across the province, and that's the first point to contact that people will go to. Follow up, Rob? Uh, on the carbon tax, there's a major change for large emitters uh, that creates, I guess, sort of, a, or continues a credit system. So mm -hmm. it seems to extend to even First Nations that have old growth forests that will get credits for that, and, and also large emitters that have to meet certain standards and might have to pay more. Could you just summarize the purpose of making this change and what you hope it does? Well, one of the changes is we're working in collaboration with the federal government. It's a mandate from the federal government. Um, and in moving forward, we're going to ensure, I mean, I think everybody believes that we have to work together when it comes to climate change. We have to work together to reduce emissions. We will be working with industry and making sure that uh, we're all in the same boat with working together to make sure that that happens. Next question, Lisa Eusta, City News 1130. Just back on the renter's rebate, I'm just wondering why now and why six years later keeping it at just $400? Um, that was what our commitment was in, but in the election 2020, and, and uh, we know that, that we've heard from people across the province how critically important the renter's rebate is to them, and for many they will be getting the full $400, and we know how substantial that is that, that will help people. Follow up, Lisa? Nope, that's all, thanks. Thank you. We'll start back on this end. Justin McElroy, CBC News. Uh, do, yeah, in the uh, update for this fiscal year, the t projected surplus has gone from $5.7 billion to $3.6 billion. Mm -hmm. It was mentioned in the presentation that any remaining money would go towards, obviously, to putting down uh, the debt. I'm wondering, uh, is the province uh, committing to any new programs that could be announced over the next couple of months that could take away from that, or are the announcements that have been made over the past few weeks uh, for that require those updated supplements, all we're going to see out of that? Well, that's a great question, and we're going to continue to, uh, you know, use the surplus to support people in the province, to do the things that we can do. Of course, we cannot uh, put the surplus on, on ongoing costs because, you know, you can't de depend on a surplus like that, and as I've been pretty clear about, we don't think we'll ever see a surplus like that again. But uh, we will be looking at ways to support people in this province as we move forward towards March 31st. Follow up, Justin? Yeah, and then the other question, you know, you talk about uh, the carbon tax rebate making up for the fact that people's gas prices will go up. You look at the fact that the renters, so what was going to be a, a rebate, turns again into a tax credit as well. What would you say maybe to families who go to getting all of this money back in the form of various credits that come at different times is confusing and hard to budget versus these one-time costs or the merits of a one-time rebate? 
Well, I think we just have to list the, the supports that we are giving to people. I haven't heard anybody complain when they got their $100 credit on their power bill. In fact, we got a lot of people telling us that was great. Haven't heard any complaints from anyone that got their checks in the mail when they got their ICBC rebate. So, you know, those are the kind of things that when we're talking to people, they're saying it makes a difference to them. It makes a difference to their lives. And they know when it's coming. People know that the the next uh, climate action tax credit is uh, coming in in. July, for instance, um, people who got uh, $500 last year are going to get up to $900 this year. Um, so people know that when those are coming. I know that uh, I've talked to a number of, of moms who've told me they know when their um, when their family benefit is coming every month, and and so people get to know when those are coming. Next question, Fran Yainer, Northern Beat. Thank you. Hi, Minister. Um, I'd just like to talk about the 586 million for treatment and recovery. Uh, apparently these are operating funds to plan for capital expansion and 95 of those 195 beds are going to be in Providence Health House. So I'm just wondering when you anticipate, if you know, when the capital funds will flow and where outside of Vancouver these beds might be. I know the ministry is, is working on that as we speak. They're working out where, where's the best places for them to go, where's the, you know, where's the best supports. So the ministry itself is, is working out those, those um, very details that you just asked. Follow up, Fran? Sure. Uh, just on uh, complex care, uh, first uh, mm -hmm. actual new beds being created. All the other uh, funding has gone to servicing existing supportive housing beds. Again, um, just wondering, you're rural, rural tough apparently, uh, wondering how, if you're going to exert or what, what your uh, impression is in terms of where these spaces are going to go outside of the lower mainland. As you know, there's a huge need everywhere, but virtually nothing in the north, for instance. Well, there's uh, very little in the north, there's very little in the Kootenays, and we know how critically important those uh, beds are for people across the province, and we will be looking, and the ministry will be looking right across the province, and there's already been discussions on communities that really need those, and they're not necessarily in the, in the major urban centres. Yeah. Over to the mic on the far left, Mary Brook, Island Social Trends. Hi. Um, there's really no way of knowing what the Bank of Canada will do with their next rate increase, and I'm just wondering how resilient BC will be if the rates do keep going up in 2023. Well, uh, when we met with the Bank of Governor uh, uh, Tiff uh, Macklin in uh, when was I there in Toronto in February? Um, we met with him with the other finance ministers, and and we got the sense that it's not going up much more. We hope, and uh, but I think we're in a really good spot uh, economically, and and we, you know, we have fiscal um, forecasters within the ministry. We have the economic forecast council within uh, that provide uh, advice for to us, and along with the Bank of Canada, we we know that uh, we feel that things aren't going to rise that much and that we could, inflation could level out by, we feel that inflation will level out by 2024. Follow up, Mary? Yeah. Um, how confident are you that the property transfer tax exemption for developers toward purpose-built rental will actually be enough of an incentive for the bigger cities to see more apartment buildings going up pretty fast? Well, we've been hearing that's what they want, and we figure that that you know that that we're going to work towards that. And I know it's something the Ministry of Housing is working on. Our next question comes from the far right microphone, Andrew McLeod, the Tai. Hi, Minister. Um, with the tax credit for renters, it, it was always promised as something to level the playing field with people receiving the homeowners grant. As you know, the homeowners grant isn't income tested. Uh, and I think the province spends around a billion dollars a year on it. This looks like 300 million a year and it is income tested. How, how fair is it? Well, it's, it's a tax credit that uh, people wouldn't be getting and it's support to people that rent. Um, the, the homeowner's grant is for people that own their homes that, and uh, we feel that the, w w what we put forward when we ran with this, that we said this is what we were going to do, is people understood that and it will support uh, almost 80% of renters in the province. Um, Follow up, Andrew? Sure. Uh, on, a, on another topic, the budget includes $125 a month increase to the shelter allowance for mm -hmm. people on income and disability as assistance. Uh, my understanding in the past was the hesitation on doing that was a, sort of a fear that that would go straight to landowners rather than benefiting the clients. Uh, I'm wondering if the thinking has changed on that and why. 
Well, we've been hearing a lot from people in that, uh, that work in the sector. We've heard from people that are, are actually on disability or, or income assistance um, that there is a real need for an increase to shelter. And, and I mean, everybody knows that the price of, of housing has gone up and, and people need that support. Our next question comes from Dirk Meissner, Canadian Press. Hi. It used to be that didn't matter what side the government, what side of government, if you posted a deficit, that wasn't a good thing. Now you've got three years of really big deficits. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you don't care about deficits anymore. I wouldn't say we don't care about deficits, but what I will say is that I think we've proven during the um, pandemic that uh, we can incur deficits by support, we do it by supporting people, but we still have a strong economy. We've got one of the strongest economies in the country, so we've proven that uh, it's, it, it's working, and uh, right now what we need to do is, it's, it, it's just not the right time to start making cuts. It's not the right time to start asking people to pay out of their pocket for services that they expect to get, and we need to ensure that we're providing those services to people and supporting people in this province, and we're gonna continue to do that. Follow up, Dirk? It has three years of projected deficits, or can you go beyond that? By the fourth year, would we possibly be in surplus? I'm not going beyond that. That's our three-year plan, and that's what's in the budget. I have to ask the smarter people at the back of the room if they want to do that. <laughs> our next question, far left microphone, Rob Buff from CTV Vancouver Island. Hi, Minister. We're hearing uh, almost daily about businesses like restaurants that are mm -hmm. going under here in Victoria and elsewhere in the province. Why is there not more, if anything, in this budget to help small businesses like restaurants? Well, actually, one of the biggest things in the budget is the Future Ready Plan, which is going to help small businesses to get the people they need, to train the people they need, to do the work they need, because we are hearing from small business, like you said, that the biggest issue for them is, is finding labour. And so we're doing what we can to support them, you know, bringing in um, the people from, um, like we've got uh, immigrants that are coming in that need the training, we've got, you know, so we're, we're working with small businesses to ensure that we get the help them to get the supports they need with labour. Follow up, Rob? Yeah, I noticed there is no uh, reference to the Belleville Terminal, something the province has talked about funding in this budget, nor was there any reference to the Island Coastal Economic Trust, something that came up last week. Why were those items not included? And I'll ask as well, the Royal BC Museum, we heard there's a lot of asbestos there, no funding for that. Uh, all of those issues are ones that we're, we're looking at and talking about, and, and uh, you'll hear more soon. All right, starting again at this microphone, Laura Broms, Czech News. Hi, so uh, last year's budget, uh, to asking about housing, last year's budget called for building 114,000 homes over 10 years. I know there's no numbers in this budget, um, but then in June 2022, the CMHC came out with a report that said BC needs to build 570,000 new affordable homes by 2030. So I was wondering if the new housing plan will come close to that CMHC number or if it'll be closer to the numbers in last year's budget. I think the biggest number that I, I want to reiterate is the 4.2 billion that we're spending on housing over the next three years. And when Minister Kalon comes out with his uh, housing plan in, in the coming weeks, he'll come up with the exact numbers for you. But I just, I, I, we know that we, you know, we need to do more with the housing plan, and that's exactly what this budget's going to do. Follow up, Laura. Yeah. So there's also uh, for safety. There's two teams: the Repeat Violent Offending intervention initiative and the special investigation and targeted enforcement. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how uh, the province expects these two teams to address safety concerns in the province. Well, they'll both work on safety concerns across the province, depending where they are, and, and some of them are dealing with repeat offenders, some of them dealing with the issues on the streets. I think the ministry could probably give you more details on the exact, uh, what, what the exact programs are, where they're going to under, be undertaken and, and how they're going to be doing that. A couple more questions in the room before we go to Vancouver. Next question is Les Lane, Times Colonist. Oh, thanks, Minister. Um, the new housing push that started last fall, you've got 57 million committed to unlock more homes through new residential zoning measures and the higher provincial targets that you expect from municipalities. Do you have any idea or any details on how, that's, how that money is going to be used to uh, increase increase the number of homes municipalities are approving? 
Well, I know both the Ministry of Housing and the Ministry of Municipalities are working together on what they can do to ensure that the communities have the supports they need. And I mean, for instance, the Growing Communities Fund that uh, we just announced, the $1 billion that will be going to every single uh, community across the province, whether it's a, a city, town, or a regional district, um, will be getting funding. The amounts will be announced, I believe, on Friday. Um, and they can use that towards all the things they need to do to ensure that they can build the housing they need. Follow up, Les? On the same topic, you got 91 million committed over three years on a pilot project to provide incentives to homeowners to build secondary suites. Mm -hmm. uh, can you fill us in a bit on that? Where is it going to start and um, how much of it? So can you work it out for an individual homeowner? You're going to subsidize their, uh, their basement suite? Well, the, the ministry's working on those on those but those exact questions that you're asking right now um, we're hoping to have the pilot projects in in happening by the next year beginning of next year um, but it's it's I think it's an exciting initiative and and we've heard from homeowner, homeowners who do really want to um, put a rental suite in their homes and and it's a way that we can do that by supporting them and but the ministry is just in the process of, of working out those those very issues right now Last question and follow-up in the room before we go to Vancouver. We go to Arshdeep Kaur Batu of FYI Media Group. Hi, Minister. Again, for the safe communities, as uh, you guys are boosting $462 million for policing enforcement and innovation, are they enough money or how the province and cities are working together? Sorry, say that again. Are they how enough? The how the cities and the province, they're working together. Well, we have to work together. If we're not working together, it's not going to work. I mean, we really, you know, we, and I know that uh, Minister Sparnworth is very keen on this and, and has been working with municipalities across the province to ensure that we, by working together, we will be able to have safe and healthy communities. Uh, Follow up, Arshdeep? So as we can see all the spending, uh, and uh, you said, uh, government won't pull back and or they won't cut services, will people face any new hidden taxes? Any hidden taxes? No, I think we've been pretty transparent today of uh, what we're bringing forward, and we've got the list of, of taxes and, and the benefits that people are going to be getting by investing in people. So I think that we've been pretty upfront about that. <laughs> I know we have. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we're going to go to Vancouver. Our first question is going to come from Loanne, uh, just Loanne, excuse me, Joanne Lee Young of the Vancouver Sun. Hi, Minister. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about why the refreshed housing plan is not part of this budget. Why it's not part of this budget? Well, the number is part of this budget. It's $4.2 billion, and uh, Minister Kalin and his team will be working to make sure that they get the, the uh, plan uh, in place, and, and it'll be announced in the coming days. Do you have a follow-up, Joanne? And is that $4.2 billion additional spending, housing advocates um, looking for ways to improve housing affordability identified speeding up 4.2 billion in planned housing investments earmarked for 2022 to 2028 to this budget cycle. Is that, I'm just wondering if you can talk more about if that 4.2 billion is new or had already been earmarked. Well, this, the $4.2 billion is to ensure that we build new homes, that we get supports for renters, for middle-income families, for Indigenous peoples. We are actually moving forward again with uh, more supports. We're doubling the number of, of homes for Indigenous people in this province, um, more homes for seniors, um, and we're also increasing the number of um, student student housing beds, which is, is will be more. It's new. Um, we're going to be buying land near uh, transit areas, so that or transit development, so that we can build new homes in those areas. Um, of course, the extra support to renters through the new renters tax um, so and, and new tax incentive to encourage construction of new purpose-built rentals so all of those are, are, are new funds and we're also looking at uh, more supports to um, for supportive and complex care beds and homes for people and uh, more support to communities that have um, issues with substantive enca encampments. Our next question from Vancouver Derek Penner Vancouver Sun. Hi. The, the budget kind of spells out the, the stress that the forest sector is, is under in the, in the natural resource revenues. Um, it, it includes um, uh, initiatives like the, the Forest Manufacturing uh, Jobs Fund. Uh, why wasn't there more in there, though, for, uh, to help communities 
uh, transition from from the forest sector or diversify their communities? Well, that's what the manufacturing plan is about. The manufacturing jobs is, is to support industry to, to transition. Um, there's also, you know, the billion dollar growing uh, communities fund, which will also help those communities to uh, to transition because there are some communities that uh, will need to, to do that transitioning. And, and there is supports to, to industry and workers working together on, on how we can you know how can we can refocus uh, forestry and so that it's you know moving away from uh, old growth logging and harvesting to working in the value added sector so there's substantial supports to uh, industry and and communities when it comes to uh, re retooling mills i mean the crofton mill is a perfect example of that where they're moving from um, your basic uh, basic commodities to actually uh, producing uh, utensils out of paper which are recyclable and will be utilized in the um, in the take industry which has boomed since uh, since the pandemic and continues to boom so do you have a follow-up Derek yeah again um, in natural resources the, the the budget includes it's six million dollars to to work on a critical critical mineral minerals strategy um, why wasn't there more uh, a more spelled out critical mineral minerals strategy for for the budget to follow well that that will be coming out a more uh, spelled out uh, strategy but I think what's important to recognize is we need to ensure that we have supports in place to for for those critical minerals that we need for all of your laptops and your phones and all the things that we need um, we need copper for we need those critical minerals we need to mine them so that we can move forward and for a sustainable clean economy which is what everybody wants to do a couple more questions before minister has to leave we'll go to Nelson Bennett business in Vancouver yeah, um, businesses are always concerned about taxes, and from what I can tell, it doesn't look like there are any new taxes or any major tax increases. Please correct me if I've missed anything. But uh, the one change I do see that I think industry will be interested in is the output-based pricing mechanism for carbon taxes. Can you just explain briefly how that works and why it's being implemented? I'll try to explain that. It's been explained to me, but uh, thanks for that question. Um, so what it means is that uh, the more um, carbon that you put out, the more you'll pay. Um, you'll get to end if you bring in innovation to your your industry, innovation to, to lower your carbon taxes, you'll pay less. Um, if you get to a certain point where you're, um, you have to pay, you can actually buy credits from uh, someone that has lower uh, carbon tax credits. So it's, it's a, I don't know if that's made it simpler or, or harder to understand, but it, it's definitely, uh, there's lots of people in this room that are way better at explaining. I'm looking for him. Where is he? Steven's over there. <laughs> He's way better and you're not here, but there's, if you want more information on it, we can get it for you. A uh, follow-up, Nelson. Yeah, well, I, I just presume that it's it's meant to address leakage, um, in, in which uh, a company, say a cement company, is competing with uh, a producer outside of BC that's not paying the carbon tax. Is is that not what output uh, output based price pricing is is all about to address leakage? I think it's to incentivize people to and to know that they have to lower their carbon tax um, and it, it, it's actually a it'll be a, a Canadian uh, in, uh, industry as we move forward everybody in, in Canada is going to be slowly moving towards this it's, it's a uh, federal government mandated program and and will come into place for everybody so um, we have to deal with climate change in a global way and and uh, that's one way we can do it our last question for today comes from Vancouver. Zach Vizcarra, the TAI, please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question, Minister. Um, it looks like BC added around 96,000 new full-time jobs net year over year, but the labor force participation rate actually declined and you predict it will decline further. I know obviously a lot of this is retirements, but the prime working force of 20, age, people aged 25 to I think 44, that also declined too. What's happening? Why, are, why is a shrinking share of our population working? Well, actually, one of the things I do want to say that um, is that the seventy five percent of the people that have the that came into the workforce in the last year, seventy five percent of them were actually women. And uh, that the growth in women in the in the mark in the tr labor market has been huge, um, and it can be directly attributed to our child care programs. Um, in fact, when uh, we met with with um, the Governor of Canada with with Tiff Macklin in in last in February, he said that, uh, 
he saw that growth across the, the country, um, and he directly attributed it to childcare as well. But he also said that, you know, the provinces that have really expanded their childcare programs have done better, and we have done significantly better when you think that 75% of the people that came into the workforce were women. And we're also looking to, at ways of how can we um, help people to get the training they need to get into the workforce, how can they get the supports they need, how can, you know, you know foreign credentials, that people can get their credentials uh, better, like quicker, in a quicker process than they do. So there's a lot of things we're looking at that we can, you know, work with, with small businesses, work with industry to ensure that they're getting the supports they need to get the labor that they need. Did I give Zach a follow-up? Zach, follow-up. <laughs> my apologies. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure that answers my question, though. Why is, again, is the labor participation force shrinking? Well, I don't. It's I don't know if it's shrinking. From from my perspective, is it's a sense that we have you know we have the lowest unemployment in in the in the country, and uh, we are putting people to work, um, and we need to get more people into the province, and we need to get more people trained. We need to get make, make sure that people have the skills that they they need to work in the industries that are, are needing more people. Um, we're also bringing in more people, so it's a, it's I think it's a, it's a combination of all the factors. Thank you very much. That concludes today's media availability. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you to all the media. I will remind you as well that Treasury Board staff will remain available to answer technical questions on background only. As well, the stakeholder scrum process will begin shortly. There are two rooms up on this same level where stakeholder scrums will be being conducted. Well, today I think we see a, a significant investment. It's historic in magnitude to see you know, a one billion dollar number on a budget around mental health and substance use care. Ten years ago, we, we weren't seeing those kinds of numbers. We're really encouraged to see that level of investment, and, and given the drug poisoning crisis, to see a focus on substance use treatment and recovery is, is excellent. We got to do the analysis to see if they, we set a target of two billion of new resources in 2017, and it looks like they're tracking in that direction. So that's encouraging. The one worry we have is around mental health care provisioning for, for adults. So folks living with depression, schizophrenia, eating disorders, where there's such a crying need in the province right now, wanting to make sure that there's significant investment there soon, because that's also very, very urgent as well. The expansion of the Redfish model that co-links mental health and addictions together, expanding that to the rest of BC, what do you think of that? Well, the, the model, it's, it's good. It's a strong model of care. It's definitely an improvement upon institutionalized care that we used to see in bygone areas. We want to avoid any reliance on more involuntary detention. We don't want to see sweeping expansion of involuntary care. We, we track very highly already in detaining people in the province. But spaces which have dignity and good quality care, where you don't have to travel to the former Riverview lands alone to access is of course, is welcome. Diversifying that access to rural, remote communities is, is a welcome investment. And again, we'll see how long that takes. There's building and workforce implications, but encouraging to see that in the budget, too. The, the fees remain on addictions treatment yeah. uh, except for the new ones, apparently. What do you make of that split? Some banks cost people money and others won't? Well, uh, inadvertently, that does create a two-tier system. Right, and, and a few of us stakeholders were talking about the need to eliminate any kind of per diem care. It's not just for substance use too, like residential care for other mental health conditions is a per diem key, which, which is a significant barrier to people accessing care. Ideally, government would do the right thing, obliterate per diem keys across, so there's no financial barrier for substance use or mental health care. Hopefully, at Budget 24, we'll start to see that. It's a good first step. We're seeing that incremental removal of fees for this budget, for sure. So the minister says history historic investment. Do you feel whatever they've done now is historic? Well, compared to, to 10 years ago, five years ago, yes, these are historic numbers. To see $1 billion attached to substance use and mental health spending in a provincial budget it, it is historic. The last time was a half billion at $500 million. So it is historic. Again, real emphasis on substance use care, and we'd want to see, of course, that emphasis on, on mental health care writ large as well going forward. But yeah, historic is a word I would use today. How important is it for smaller communities that right now don't have any treatment centers? They have to travel far out of their communities. What do you think of the regional promise? Well, I think regionalization, we want to move beyond a postcode lottery for mental health and substance use care in this province. Where you live should not dictate the kind of care that you receive. And so we hope that these regional promises get delivered upon. So so that if you're living in Kitimat, if you're living in Prince George, if you're living in the East Kootenays, you have the same level of care as anyone else living in Vancouver. So hopefully those promises get delivered upon. You think anything is missing? 
Um, more emphasis on the, the mental health side. So there's good emphasis on substance use treatment and care, and we welcome concurrent disorders, so where people have a mental illness and a substance use problem. We've heard from people living with eating disorders, um, um, bipolar illness, schizophrenia, that there's a real crying need for more investment in those areas. And so we, we hope there's urgent need to invest there. And today is a historic day around substance use treatment, absolutely. From BC Nurse Union, I have Amman Garwal with me. Let's welcome her. So welcome, Amman, first of all. Today, we have budget. Today, the budget is released. So what do you think about the budget? Today, the budget was released. It was released on mental health addiction. It was very happy to spend it. But the nurse had mental health for it. So, we have a concern about the knowledge of the nursing system and the better system. We have a lot of early retirement, we have mental health suffer. We have a lot of people who have a lot of people who have a lot of people who have a lot that was my question ki jede mental health nurses de through jada aa reya hai ga jada concern hai ga ode bare budget de vich kuch nahi hai ga par us to baad hun tade vallon tadi union kuch finance minister de naal koi meeting set karugi ja ohna de layi koi jada letter jari karugi kis tarah de naal apni gall jadi oh finance minister tak pahunchai jaugi ha assi finance minister naal ta probably nahi gall karni assi minister of health na karunge assi hun bargaining de vich hai ga and ami contract lay so o de layi fir assi ohna नाल नेगोशिएट करूंगे फिर तुसी हुन दसो पे सारी नर्स नु तुसी के दस सपोर्ट करना है सो नर्सिंग सपोर्ट वास्ते आज दे बजट दे विच असी कह सकदे हैं कि कुछ भी नहीं हैगा अम थोड़ा थोड़ा हैगा या ट्रेनिंग उनी जेरा इंटरनेशनल एजुकेटेड नर्स ले आ क्रेडेंशियल कार्ड ले होर सीटा पर उनी समझाया नहीं पे है कि असी करना है ओदा ही दसया है पे इना असी करना पर दसया नहीं उने दी प्लान की हैगी है to implement those things. Implement, yeah. So, to see viewers in Nukush, can I talk again? तो सी आपने जरे एमएलए है गे या मिनिस्टर्स है गे उन्हनु सारे अनु कैबो पे जरे हैं नर्सा है गे या काम कर दे या पे उन्हनु सपोर्ट दे वो ता जरे हाँ हॉस्पिटल्स बनों दे या तो सी पैसे उन्हन ले खर्च दे या पर नर्सों के तो नहीं आया स्वानुओ हो जरे प्रोग्राम नर्सा ले स्कूल नू जान ले सफर कर रहे हैं मैं लगता हूँ उधर लेकिन सारे अनुराग की आवाज़ उठानी चाहिए थी हाँ जी हम सालों दो साल हो गए या दो तीन साल हो गए जरे ऐसी उन्हें कहने हैं पे जरे हैं इंटरनेशनली एजुकेटेड नर्सेस हैं कि यहाँ उन्हें कई बारी छः साल लग गए हैं अपने क्रेडेंशियल्स लाने ले सो जो दो Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Okay. This year's budget, it would have made a lot more sense to either a very skinny deficit or, or a small surplus would have been entirely manageable, I think. So we have three large successive deficits built into this current fiscal plan. Um, the, the budget for this year, the deficit is around 1.1% of GDP. Back in the depths of COVID, I think the deficit was only 1.8% of GDP. So yes, it was higher, but, but I mean, we are no longer in a COVID circumstance. Most of that is behind us now. So to be running a deficit of 1.1% of GDP does, seems ill-advised at this time. I think there will be a difference. Uh, we were proud of the budget that there's $6.4 billion going in to health care and over three million going directly into health authorities to fund the new collective agreement to make sure that uh, we have supports in place for our aging population and our growing population. There's over a billion dollars in human health resources, which is gonna really help us uh, retain and recruit uh, workers in the healthcare sector. How do you do that given that there's such a labor shortage? I mean, especially in healthcare where you look at, you know, not enough nurses, not enough ambulance paramedics, not enough family doctors. Uh, how do you actually bring the people here? Because in a 
you know, there's still a gap even if you were to uh, um, accept the credentials of people who have come here from other places. Right. Well, the $1 billion investment to health human resources is a major start. And what we can do, we have programs in uh, the health uh, authorities right now. It's called Health Career Access Program, where we actually have uh, workers, healthcare workers, ladder into other professions. Uh, for example, over the last three years, we've had 3,000 healthcare workers uh, get trained, be paid for the training, and are now care aides in our system. So we will continue to do that. We have funding for another 3,000 healthcare workers and working with uh, government on provincial recruitment and retention. Uh, criteria to make sure that we get more workers in the workplace. First of all, your name? Corey Tull. Uh, so uh, you guys were promised $100 million, right? So is uh, the promise fulfilled? Yeah, so the province has committed $100 million to the Watershed Security Fund. Uh, this is a really important step forward. Um, this really builds on the work that the province has done over the past two years through investments in the Healthy Watersheds Initiative and the Indigenous Watersheds Initiative. And so there's obviously work to do. Um, there, our, our watersheds are at risk um, after decades of degradation. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to happen to ensure that our watersheds can create create the security and health that our communities require in the face of the really the devastation that we're seeing through climate crisis, the floods, the fires, um, and the droughts. So it's a really important first step. We're encouraged to see this leadership on watershed security through this commitment, uh, and we're looking forward to working with the province moving forward to see more commitments in the future. When we come to this topic, this topic less discussed. So $100 million were promised. I believe this was not enough for the cause you are talking about. So how much more money you guys need for fulfill the aim. Yeah, so the BC Watershed Security Coalition, we've been calling for $75 million annually uh, in perpetuity. So one of the things around uh, advancing watershed security in the province is that long-term sustainable funding is really critical. And we believe that if the province creates an endowment, that this money then will be able to grow. And so we would like to see the province put in $400 million, um, which would then create the foundation for a sustainable endowment um, moving forward. Isn't anything else which is missing from this budget? Well, the, the devil's in the detail, right? And so we see that there's $100 million committed, but um, we don't know exactly what that's going to look for. We really want to ensure that the governance of the fund is co-developed with First Nations and that there's, uh, in addition to creating an endowment, that there's money that can support projects that are currently happening in communities right now. And it's unclear uh, where that money is going to come from to continue the momentum of the success that's happened in the province over the past couple of years. Let's hope for the best and yes. thank you for talking to us. Thank you so much. We have Tiffany Patron from BC Association of Chiefs of Police. She is Executive Director. Let's welcome. Welcome, first of all. Thank you so much. So how, is, uh, how do you think about the budget today? Mm, uh, police across the province, I think, are thrilled uh, with the investment that the government has made today uh, in ensuring public safety. Uh, so we represent all senior leadership across the province and are just really honoured to have uh, additional funding for some of our key projects. Are you think uh, this funding, like $480 million, are they enough for the services? Uh, I think it's a great step forward in ensuring public safety. So we will continue to collaborate with government and our key stakeholders to ensure we make progress. Mm -hmm. Do you think anything missing from the finance uh, uh, speech, uh, anything else you need for the services? Uh, like I said, this is a great step forward for us. Uh, policing in the province required an investment and that's been uh, shared today. Uh, we're just really excited about the projects that we have ahead of us and hiring new officers as well as implementing some new tools to help with mental health uh, uh, issues in the province. So today uh, the government uh, announced the mental health uh, uh, investment. It's a huge investment uh, for the province. It's, a, it's the first announcement for the mental health in BC. How do you think about the mental health uh, initiative from the province? Yeah, we think it's fantastic. Uh, obviously with decriminalization, police in the province have advocated for additional complex care and mental health resources. That's been done today. Uh, so hopefully this will help us uh, see the outcome 
outcomes that we desire from the decrim portfolio specifically, uh, but it's a great step forward, like I said. Because uh, many police officers, they are struggling with mental health as well, so this is a great uh, step forward to the police officers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Our members are human too, so uh, again, we're just thrilled with the investments in policing. Thank you for talking My to pleasure. us. My pleasure. From uh, Taxpayer Association. So, uh, your name is? My name is Carson Binda, and I'm the British Columbia Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, today we have budget for 2023. What's your reaction on it? Well, this budget is an absolute boondoggle from the taxpayers' perspective. We're seeing lots of plans for the government to spend money, but we're not seeing the plans to save that taxpayers desperately need right now. Only this government could turn a $3 billion surplus at the end of this quarter into a $4.4 billion deficit by the end of the fiscal year. So from a taxpayer's perspective, this is an example of a horribly mismanaged budget by Premier David Eby and Finance Minister Conroy. I asked the question to Finance Minister that there should be any hidden taxes for the province or the people and she said no it's a pretty transparent budget so you think it's a transparent budget? Not at all. We're seeing plan after plan after plan to spend but we're not seeing the government looking for savings the way we need them to. You hit the nail on the head when you're talking about hidden taxes, hidden fees. The government themselves admitted that the carbon tax, which is set to rise to $65 a ton this year and is only set to go up after that, is going to disproportionately hurt folks living in rural communities. So we know that the carbon tax is an example of an unequal tax which has hidden costs and impacts consumers. Uh, because uh, for, uh, for this uh, budget, they said uh, deficit uh, of $4.2 billion and then it's, uh, after three years it will be $3 billion uh, uh, deficit because this NDP government, they always uh, talking about the surplus budget. Now they are talking about deficits. So what do you think about it? We need to see plans to balance the books. When governments run deficit budgets, it costs taxpayers big money in the long run. Those deficits don't come out of uh, thin air. They require government to borrow money. And taxpayers are on the hook to repay that money. We know that this year alone, we're taxpayers are spending $3.3 billion on debt repayment. That's set to jump all the way up to $4.4 billion in debt repayment alone by 2025. So we need the government to look at a real tangible plan to balance the books and make sure that they're living within their means. And uh, anything else you want to uh, say about this budget? Absolutely. Like I said, this budget is an absolute boondoggle from the taxpayer's perspective. We need concrete plans to save money, not the increased spending year on year and increased deficits that we're seeing from this government. Thank you for talking to us and let's see what they're going to do in coming years. Thank you so much for your time. We have Paul from BC Agriculture Council. Let's welcome. Paul, welcome. Thank you so much. So what do you first think about today's budget? Uh, I, I think it was interesting, especially the food security initiative was very exciting to us uh, for BC Agriculture Council. Uh, food security is really a, a significant issue for a lot of British Columbians and uh, the government is putting $160 million into that, about $111 million of which is going to produce primary agriculture production and processing, so we, it, that's certainly a, a historic commitment. So you s it looked satisfied by the funding, but uh, you think more funding needed for the British Columbia? Uh, I think um, there are certainly areas where improvements could be made, but uh, overall we're, we're happy to see what uh, has come out of this uh, budget process. As well, the emergency uh, readiness funding is, is certainly exciting, $85 million over three years. In 2021, there were devastating floods that had affected a lot of agriculture producers in British Columbians more generally. Uh, other disasters that were experienced, the heat domes, for example. So this uh, commitment to the emergency readiness is, is um, very interesting to us and we're looking forward to working together with the government in the future. Do you think anything missing from your side? Um, well, it, there, there's always something more that you could ask for, uh, of course, to, to support producers, but you know, we're, we're overall uh, satisfied with what we see uh, out of this budget. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.